Hello internet, uh, we're going to do another vlog style update. I've already opened the can of worms by talking about the things that are going on in my life, so I thought I would keep you appraised of it. Plus I don't have anyone to talk to, so it will be helpful for me to vocalize these things. Um, hey, And hey, if you're not into this type of content, that's totally fine. You know, I understand this is not why people started watching me. People didn't start watching me to hear about how horrible my life is. Most people, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't really know why people watch my content. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that YouTubers are supposed to know, but I really don't. Uh, maybe it's my dry sense of humor. Maybe it's the stories I tell. Maybe it's just, you like Cataclysm, and I did a lot of Cataclysm content. So, you know, I know that this is not for everyone. If you don't want to watch this, that's totally fine. There should be probably a Left 4 Dead episode that went up the same day that this gets uh, posted on the channel. So go watch that instead. Or check out some of my back series that you never took the time to watch. But for those of you that are interested in what's going on with me and how things are playing out, let's talk about it. So I last left you, I told you um, my brother had been essentially planning to kill me. There was a uh, confrontation between he and I. My family, I left for work, my family, uh, he called my mother, my mother told my sister to call my home because they thought I was at home and they were worried that he was going to try to hurt me because he was making death threats, talking about killing me, talking about killing my mother. Sister calls my family, says, hey, get him out of the house, I'm actually at work, police get called, they come, they take my brother, they escort him to the hospital. Um, where he was uh, placed under, you know, a uh, psychiatric hold and evaluation. I was very upset, um, as as one would expect from someone in your family plotting to kill you. Um, I was, it was a terrible day for me, you know, because I had to work. On top of that, I was worried about my family's safety. I didn't know how things got resolved. And then, you know, like 40 minutes into my work day, I actually came home because I was like, screw it, I have to know my family is safe. On my way home, they called me, you know, as I got back into town here, and they explained that he had been taken to the hospital. So, that's where that night ended. The next day, my family was telling me, oh, we should, you know, put locks on your bedroom door because they were planning to bring him home. And I didn't want him to come home because how am I supposed to, like, how am I supposed to sleep in a house where someone was planning to kill me? How am I supposed to, his, his bedroom is adjacent to our bathroom, and the only lock between that door is a simple little hook uh, latch. So he could, at any time while I'm on the toilet or in the bathtub or whatever, he could come just pop that really easily from his inside his room and come in and attack me. You know, how am I supposed to walk out of the house at night, excuse me, uh, to go to work? How am I supposed to walk out in the dark knowing that he could be lying in wait? What happens when he slashes my tires? What happens when my family cooks dinner and, uh, you know, they set aside a plate for me and my brother puts glass in it or poisons me or something. You know, once someone opens that can of worms of, I, I'm, I'm planning to kill someone, how could I ever be safe with him in the house with me? So I was very upset and concerned that my family was going to bring him home. And my family often is very protective of him. They're very enabling of him. And I was concerned that they would put him having a place to live above my safety. So what I thought was going to happen was my family was going to bring him back home. Nothing would have been resolved. Nothing would have changed. And it would just be a matter of time until he tried to stab me or something. So that was my, I think, Monday. Um, Sunday into Monday is when we were... That, that was Sunday, I think. And it was... Uh, I was worried. And I was angry at my brother. Like, at first I wasn't angry. I was very numb and kind of hurt by it. And then after like a day or two, I started to be angry with him because of like, just, I didn't do anything, you know, like it's not anything that I've done to him. It's just the only things I've ever done to my brother. I've always said things like, Hey, can you please like, so I have a balcony adjacent to my bedroom. Uh, he would come out here when I'm at work to smoke and I would come home every night and there would be cigarette ash all over the wooden floor of the balcony. And we have a very old house. So I would say to him, like, hey, you know, can you please not ash on the wood? Because I'm concerned the house might catch fire. And what I didn't say is that you burned down your last house by accident. You started fires here by accident. Please be mindful. You know, I'm concerned that he will set our house on fire. And he would spit on the wood. And I would say, hey, you know, I walk out there. Can you please not spit where I where I stand, right? 
So like the only things I've ever pestered him about are really innocuous, completely reasonable things. Hey, you know, when you get a shower, could you please rinse the tub afterwards? Because if you don't, then all your like body hair and skin cells, all that gross crap, it sticks to the tub. Then when I want to hop in there, I have to get down on my hands and knees and scrub out someone else's filth. And that's really not fair, you know. And these are reasonable requests. They're very small requests. And we've brought them up to him about 10,000 times. And he always ignores them and, and chooses not to do them. So the only thing I've ever done to my brother is ask him for really basic courtesy and, and basic, you know, household type stuff. But he has mental illness and he his mind is so warped that at this point, anything anyone in the family says to him, it's because of me. So like that night... He'd been blasting his music out front. My family went out and asked him to turn it down. In his mind, I had sent my family out there to complain at him. And it just snowballed in his delusions that I was, you know, like I'm the puppet master of the house and I'm controlling everyone. And uh, I'm telling him what to do, trying to force him to live a certain way. And that triggered him and he, you know, that's when things escalated. But anyway, that's not really what we're here to talk about. So I started to get angry at my brother uh, for the things that he's done and said. I started to get angry with my family because it felt like they were putting him over me and my safety. But I was supposed to have a psych appointment on Monday where I thought, okay, I can talk to my therapist. We can decide what to do. My thought was, even if my family's not willing to take steps to protect me, I could file for a PFA. You know, there's enough documented stuff of him being dangerous and harassing me and things that I could probably get a judge to say he can't be here, which was like the nuclear option. I really didn't want to do that because it would upset my family a lot, but I'm an adult and I have a reasonable, like I have, I'm permitted to take steps to protect myself. So I was thinking about that. I wanted to talk to my psych. Well, of course they canceled my appointment and I'm just sitting here like a dope waiting on the phone to ring. And uh, then I find out they left me a message on the number they're not supposed to call and told me they weren't going to be calling. So that sucks. I actually still have not spoken to my psych. Uh, we rescheduled for next Wednesday. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty irritated because uh, I guess they had a COVID outbreak. So they're they're going to uh, like e-meetings, but I don't have a webcam. And she gave me, like we she called me. Uh, I was in the parking lot yesterday at the dollar store. She called me. I didn't really have time to talk to her. She said they were going to e-meetings, and I said, like, I don't have a camera. And she basically said, you need to buy a camera. And I told her no. And I think that's going to be a point of frustration because I'm not doing that. I don't, one, I don't want them to see the inside of my house. And two, I don't see a reason to have a camera when we can just speak. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. So I still haven't spoken to my psych, but things have changed with my brother. So... I, after a day or two, I started to feel guilty. Like it, it turned to anger. And then after that, I started to feel guilty. I started thinking like, this is his house too. You know, I do want him to have a safe place to go. Even if it meant me being a little unsafe. Because there are so many people in the world. There are so many people who end up living on the street because their families write them off. And, and just don't, they don't want to deal with it anymore. And they turn them loose. And I don't want that for my brother. I don't want him to be homeless. So I started thinking like, okay, well, you know, he's in a mental health facility. Maybe we can safety plan with his therapist where we can set up rules and restrict like a home plan, like restrictions and, and red flags and when we should call for help. You know, if he starts displaying these symptoms, we can safety plan with his therapist we can put locks on all the doors, you know, I can just be really careful when I go outside, I can keep my eyes peeled to watch for him and make sure I'm safe. And, you know, I started to think like how we could make it work, you know, uh, cause I felt bad. I don't, I don't want my brother to be homeless. I don't want him to be living that kind of life. I want him to have a safe place to go. Even if it might mean he would attack me, I don't know. I don't have a lot of value on my own life. I don't care that much. If he would attack me, I feel like I'd be able to defend myself in most situations. But, um, I don't know. I'm still on the fence about it. But anyway, they actually transported him to a different health facility. 
they took him across the state to to be in a different facility and that is a huge red flag because they wouldn't do that if they were planning to send him home you're not going to send someone you know 3 hours away to the other corner of the state if uh if you knew they were going home soon and he called my mother uh, and this was several days after you know that that confrontation and when they spoke she said he didn't know where he was he didn't understand why he was being held he thought he was in prison he thought that the police were holding him and he didn't understand why um so he's still not okay mm, i originally thought like oh he's high and once he sobers up they'll release him because it will ju they'll just blame it on the drugs and say like okay he was just high now he's more rational he's not high anymore but they actually think that he may have taken something that was laced with something else because he's not recovering. He's still extremely delusional. And at this point, it's uh, it's Wednesday as I record this. So it's four days later and he's still completely delusional. He's still in that he, he doesn't understand what is going on with him or, or what's happening. And once I heard that, I knew he couldn't come home. Um. Like step one of re like regardless of what your issue is, step one is acknowledging it and then understanding why it happened. So the whole incident with me and my brother on Sunday, the confrontation that led to death threats and talking about planning to kill me, that is the problem. He needs to recognize that that's a problem and seek to understand why it happened so that we can prevent it from happening again in the future. But if you don't understand that there's a problem, if you view that as a completely reasonable reaction, we can't move forward because it's just going to happen again. Does that make sense? So when they told me that he, you know, is not understanding why he's in trouble and, and why these steps had to be taken, I knew he wasn't coming home. When I heard they transported him to a different facility, I knew he wasn't coming home. It's very upsetting to me and my family. You know, I was coming around to him coming back. I don't want, when I think about my brother, I don't think about him now. Like, this is not who he is, okay? Him being mentally ill, him being a drug user, it's been this way for a long time, but I don't view him that way. That's not how I think about him in my head. In my head, he's we're, I'm 10 and he's 8, you know, and I think about all the years that we were brothers, that we grew up together, that we lived in the same room for most of our childhood. I had no friends. He was one of my only friends and companions. I remember all the good times. I remember all the stuff that we did, you know. I remember playing Atari with him, and I remember, you know, doing stupid stuff, climbing on the roof with him, and just, like, all the stupid things that kids do. My brother was a constant, you know, friend when I was a kid, in a bad situation with no friends and no one that seemed to care about me. So it breaks my heart that this is where it's at, you know? And it's like, now I don't know where we go from here. He's not okay. They think he might have done permanent damage by taking drugs that were laced with something because he's not recovering, you know? He's under a lot of stress because of his court case. Maybe it's just a severe mental break. Maybe he's just having a breakdown. It happens, you know. I've had my share of mental issues. You know, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it is permanent brain chemistry damage. Maybe it is just any number of things. But I don't know. And I'm worried about him, but I'm also worried about myself. I'm worried about my family. I don't know. You know, it's all up in the air now because it's like he called the other day, the house the other day, and they didn't get to the phone in time. And then they asked me, they they were leaving, my family was leaving. So they were like, hey, do you want the phone in case he calls? And I just told them like, no, like what, he's delusional. I'm just going to, he shouldn't even talk to me. He'll be more upset if he talks to me. He'll think I'm gatekeeping you and trying to keep you from talking to him and He'll think that I'm, like, he might get angry. It might trigger another breakdown or something. He really shouldn't speak to me. I shouldn't see him. I shouldn't talk to him. And I don't know what you do in this situation. 
you know, he hasn't called back. We don't really know what's going on with him. I'm worried about him, you know, like I'm worried that this is, this is the first step down that path where there's no coming back. I'm concerned that he might not get better. I'm concerned that this might be forever, that he might never recover, that he might permanently be held in a facility or, you know, that he'll go to court and be taken to prison, even though he's clearly mentally ill. I'm concerned that he'll try to escape. I'm concerned that he'll end up on the streets alone and scared and, you know, I just, I don't know what to think. Okay, my family's making a lot of noise. Let's wrap this up. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to me. I'll be back with something in the future. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a crap situation.